Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together and sing together. A song from John chapter 9. Many, many English Bible translations kindly put the title for each passage, which is edited by the editor, editor, not from the original text. So if you read today's passage from the Bible you have, you may see the title, The Temptation of Jesus, for this passage. What is temptation? What is temptation? According to uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, temptation is the act of considering or causing to consider doing something wrong or unwise. Cookies and candies are great temptations for kids and even adults. <laughs> there are two men uh, who were cookie lovers. Uh, they began to eat cookies in the box. They loved it and then they, the box, were, box was almost half empty. They realized that they had too many cookies already. So one of them said, we've got to stop eating cookies. We'll be sick. The other guy said, I agree, but let me have just one more. Then they began to make excuses to just one more and another. You eat fast, and I eat slowly, so I can have one more. No, you start it first, so I can eat one more. Something like that. So finally, they finished the box, the box of cookies. Then one of the guys said, I know where I can, I can buy this box, so I can let me go ahead and buy a new box. It doesn't hurt anybody if we just buy the box. And he bought the box and they came back. And the other guy said, if we just open the box, it doesn't hurt anybody. You can guess the story after that, right? Temptation is like a husband going shopping with his wife. When his eyes follow a young woman, well-shaped and stylish, his wife says, even, even without looking up from, from the item she is examining, was it worth the trouble you are in? <laughs> That's the te temptation. We can think of so many examples of temptation in our, in our lives. One more computer game. One more drink. One more role in the gambling. One more show off of my accomplishment. In the story of Adam and Eve, we read an example of temptation. The serpent asked to the woman, did God say, did God say you shall not eat from, the, from any tree in the garden? It is a kind of question that makes us turn our eyes from God and focus on what we, we don't have instead of what we already have. It is a kind of question to make a small crack in the relationship with God. You may have heard the same kind of questions in your life. Is it worthy to believe in God? Or is it, what is the benefit of being a Christian? God solve all your problems? You don't have any problem in your life? Everything is going well if you have faith in God? Any question that make a small crack in the relationship with God. The serpent questions about the real intention of God forbidding Adam and Eve from eating the, true, the fruit as if God hides 
something from them. Just like fake news these days, it is a clueless, clueless question, but it is meant to be misleading. If your friend, if your friend asks, say to you, do you know why Tom is so nice to you? Just one question brings up a lot of ideas and questionable emotions, unintended by Tom. Yes, a question has a power to affect our relationships. Then the serpent tries to make Eve, Eve convinced of the intention of God. If you eat the fruit of the tree, you will not die. God forbid it because God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. For the first time, for the first time, they viewed God through the lens of suspicion. Why can we know what is good and evil and have and we have to depend on God for discernment. Does God ignore what we have accomplished in naming all the animals? What would be our relationship with God like if we have the same knowledge as God? Maybe it is a good thing because our relationship with God would be better if we are in the same level with God. We know God better than, better than now because we are in the same level. The temptation to control our own lives is current and real. We don't like, we don't like the idea of dependency. We don't like the idea of vertical relationship. We don't like the ambiguity in life so that we try to cultivate our future to make it clear, crystal clear. Then God becomes a simple advisor or counselor who does not impose anything on us. We control our lives and God only helps. We have more suggestions, suggestions to God than simply obeying what God already commanded to us. This is the temptation we Christians face in our lives. What is God's response then? God says, let God be God. Let God be God in your life. Let God drive your way because God is good and sincere all the time. God is the creator of our lives. However, in the passage of Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus was far more intense and substantial than Adam and Eve. As I said earlier, the temptation of, of Jesus is the title of the story in many translated Bibles. However, the word temptation is not quite accurate translation. The Greek word for to tempt is peirazo. We don't know the exact meaning uh, of the word uh, because the Koine Greek, the Greek in the Bible, is a dead language from the, uh, from the ancient time. So one way to examine the exact meaning of the word is to compare it with other usages of the word in the Bible. One example of the word peirazo in Matthew 20, is in Matthew 22, 35, where a lawyer asked a question to Jesus. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
Matthew 22:35 says, "This lawyer, this lawyer, peirajo Jesus." So we can translate it as tempt or test. Most of English translations use the word test in this case. which seem to uh, suggest that the line between temptation and the test is not clear cut. The point I'm trying to make here is this. If we consider the test by the devil as mere temptations, we fail to find their meanings in our lives. If the test is only pertinent to Jesus, we may find him strong enough to overcome these temptations, but lose the gravity of the message for our lives. Many scholars understand that the test was given to Jesus by the devil to make him avoid the, avoid the suffering and death on the cross. Because Satan perceived his destiny if Jesus fulfilled his ministry on earth. As a result, he established a plan to divert his ministry to satisfy his own needs. The first test of the devil was to make Jesus turn stone, stone, stones to bread. By making bread with stones, Jesus could satisfy his need after fasting 40 days. He was famished and could make foods in many ways. Maybe not from the stones, but from the sky, like manna falling, falling from, from the sky in the time of Exodus. I think it is cool to make stones, make bread out of stones. Small stones will become like bagels, Muffins or morning rolls, hot and steamy. Bigger stones will become chibata or cornbread. Large stones will turn to banana bread or other loaves of bread that perfectly match with jam and bread, jam, I mean, butter and jelly. The first test is understandable in that the threat is most fearful for anyone. The desire for survival is an active process of conscious and unconscious reasoning in humanity. It is the foundation of, the, of philosophy, religion, economy, politics, human relationship, you name it. A threat to our survival shakes us to our core. To feed ourselves when we are hungry is not a mere temptation, but the basic human instinct. There are so many things in our lives that threaten our desire for survival. We have to do, we have to do whatever it takes to overcome our fear of famine, despair, loneliness, and health to continue our lives. In the movie John Q, where Daniel Washington played the role of, of the father whose son was dying in the hospital, they were told that the treatment and operation of the child were refused because of the limit of their insurance coverage. I remember the face of the wife crying out and shouting to the husband, do something. If you are the father, do something. Then John Q takes hostages in the hospital, demanding an Im immediate operation of his son. The desire of survival 
demands us, demands us to do something. How did Jesus respond to Satan? He said, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He experiences the dire condition of famine, but he does not want to be dominated by it. He understands the desire for survival, but not at the cost of the relationship with God. For him, to do something is never contradictory to who he is. This is a great challenge for Christians. This is not a mere temptation. Can we live differently in the face of desperation? Can we confess God in the same way even when we suffer from the hardship of life? Can we be what we are called to be in spite of all the challenges in life? That's the same temptation we are facing in our lives. Second test, once we overcome the challenge of the desire for survival, we often face another challenge, like Jesus. The devil took Jesus to the holy city, which was supposed to be, the, be Jerusalem in the context of Israel. There, the devil placed Jesus on the very pinnacle of the temple, which was the highest point in the city in which the powers of heaven and earth interacted. Then the devil suggested Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down and you will not be hurt at all because, the all because of the angels lifting you up with their hands. The second test of Jesus can be characterized, characterized as an increased level, level two of the test. The world the world continued to demand people to prove their quality. The world continued to demand Christians to prove their quality as well. Just like students have to pass proficiency tests in school in order to proceed to higher grades, people are forced to prove their worth. Jesus was asked to prove himself to be the son of God by casting himself down to the ground. When Christians engage in the practice of faith by engaging with the people in need or the project to build a faith community, we are often asked to prove ourselves. Some people raise their expectations so high as if they are looking forward to the failure of the believers so that they can say, I knew it. I knew you would fail. To strive to meet high expectations of the people may never be successful. We try to be faithful, but not excellent. We try to display who we are but not who are expect to be. As a pastor, it is a great, great challenge to give up on my perfectionism. Many people in the, in the Mandan Presbyterian Church are so generous and give me warm responses to my sermons. Honestly speaking, those responses are encouraging but at the same time, frightening. As much as I hold on to the responses from the people, I sense that my centeredness goes astray because it makes me believe that it is my ability to attract people. Every time I fall into the idea, 
I am reminded that the goal of my ministry is to draw people to God, not to me. Secondly, I'm also reminded that as a baseball fan, that good hitter has only three times hit out of ten. They are called to be good hitter. So I, my expectation is not super high. I still want to be a good passer, but I can hit ten out of ten. I don't want to do my ministry to prove about me. This is not the attitude of the servant. When we focus on satisfying others' expectations, we lose our joy. We lose our excitement to serve God and to serve people. For the third test of, the, of Jesus, Satan took Jesus again to the mountain top where they could see all the empires of the world and their glory. The devil promised Jesus to give all the kingdoms of the world if he fell down and worshipped the devil. If Jesus accepted the offer, he could achieve the control of the world without going through the cross. The third test can be called the ultimate submission. For Jesus, it was the way to deprive Satan of his power without suffering on the cross. But it was to subsume the power of God to the power of Satan. Jesus repulsed the devil by saying, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship to the Lord your God and serve him only. Through the test of Jesus, we can see the character of temptation Satan gives to the people. Satan gives to the people same temptations. This is his strategy. He makes people obey to him by provoking the desire for survival in them. That's the first strategy. If we pass, the society continues to demand us to prove ourselves, to prove how good we are. If we reach a certain level, we are encouraged or forced to play the role to reinforce the system in which the first and second tests become the social norms. Many people who fail this test, the last test, become great advocates for the system. A lot of people say, been there, done that, to justify why he does not act. He does not behave the way he should be. How can you overcome the test given by the devil? What are the practical strategies to defy the system of the devil? How can we draw the line between our basic needs and false desires? Paul Tillich, my favorite theologian, explained the ambiguity of human desires. We survive because we have desires but we are tempted because of our desires. Where is the line between basic need and temptation? If we eat good, delicious food, where is the line we satisfy ourselves, our needs, and more toward to a leaning toward to a temptation? Half, full, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, can you order one more bowl of rice, which is free? That's temptation, or that's satisfying your own needs? Where is the line? How much is too much? How less is too less? Paul Tilly points out that the relationship 
between freedom and destiny. Freedom, we love freedom. We don't like destiny. Destiny and freedom, they are opposite concept to each other. We tend to employ our freedom to explore the best way to increase our happiness. However, how do we define happiness? Most probably, our definition of happiness is derived, derived from the social norms, which is also called conformity. Precisely, it's called conformity to destiny. We are attuned to use our freedom to be accommodated to, to the destiny. How ironical is it? How can we escape from the cycle to be accommodated to the devil's control? Freedom, destiny. We struggle between two, but in the ultimate sense, they are the same. How can we escape from the test of the devil then? Jesus has two points. One, Jesus uphold the word of God. He cast out the demon, demon and devil by citing the, the word of God. Second, he fixed his eyes on the people living in the outside the cycle. There are a lot of people who can accomplish their freedom and destiny. The cycle is broken in their lives. When Jesus lives with them, stay with them, talk with them, he learns, he knows the cycle is not permanent. Devil, the test of devil, test by devil, is always let us focus on the cycle that we always want to satisfy the desire for survival and then to prove ourselves and to advocate the system. But when we focus on God, but when we focus on the people in need, we can get out of the cycle and find our way to win over the temptations. The life and ministry of Jesus show how we can break out of the cycle of freedom and destiny in the world. Jesus loved everyone. Jesus spent time with the most vulnerable people, outsiders rather than insiders, saying, I'm, I did not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Jesus accepted his sufferings rather than avoiding them. Jesus demanded his disciples to deny themselves and take up their cross. This is the way to overcome the test from Satan. As we enter the Lenten season, let us remind you that the temptations are not easy to resist. By the grace of God only, we can resist the temptations and test given by Satan. C.S. Lewis said in his book, Mere Christianity, only those who try to resist temptations know how strong it is. A man gives in to temptation after five minutes, simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. This is why bad people, in some sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving it in. I hope and pray that the victory of Jesus over the temptations becomes our victory. As we focus our eyes on Jesus and as I fo fix our focus, eyes on the people in need, we can escaped the cycle of Satan 
and envision the glory of God in our lives and through our lives. Amen.